if we don't. Um, a couple of things I thought was cool is sober minded means like gird up your loins, which means uh, gather up your robe and wrap it around you, usually with some type of belt. You remove anything that might trip you because you're about to get to work. You're about to run. The idea of being sober minded, clear, alert, awake, stable, be alert and get about something. So this is another way to interface between like, okay, you're called to do something and now you need to get about doing it. Um, I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, and, and then, yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Dennis Edwards had a lot of really cool things to say about this text. One that I just think was interesting is the contrast between God's word and the way we use words. We use words with malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. These are the type of words we use. This is how we engage with words. But God's word is imperishable. It is the one that it redeems. It, it, there's this massive contrast. And so God, you know, God through 1 Peter, is saying there's a difference there's a contrast between these two worlds, and we need to, we need to align ourselves uh, with, with Jesus. So, uh, I think some of the questions I have about this text um, is just how can a mom, how can a new mother, a newborn uh, mother type of thing, uh, how can she identify her newborn's dirty diaper by the way it smells? but not necessarily recognize when she smells. Or middle school boys, why do they think that they could just apply, if they just apply enough body, act, uh, uh, body spray or Axe body spray, that they don't have to bathe properly? And somehow they think the mixture of that doesn't oppress the rest of us. You guys know what I'm talking about? And how come we have a good sense of what smells good and what smells bad? And we have a sense of, and we're critical about what smells bad. Like, mm, man, she stinks or he stinks or that stinks. Or like we roll up our nose. You know, you know what I'm talking about? You walk into a place, you're like, oh, something's wrong here. You know, you have a sense about it. You, your smell, you, it, you, you're keen to it. You know what smells good and kind of what smells bad. And, and we're critical of what smells bad. But how are we so bad at recognizing when we're the ones that smell bad? We're so accurate. If you take a piece of meat and you smell it, you can smell if it's bad. It's as accurate as doing petri dish tests to see if the bacteria count is dangerous. All you have to do is go and you, your nose is as accurate. Yet, you'd be walking around offending everybody and have no clue. Do you know what I'm talking about? Men, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. That middle school years. Today we're talking about B.O. That's what we're talking about. We have a sense of holiness. We like it. We like when we're around those people. We like when we're around those things that are life-giving and they're holy and they smell good. But our unholiness is like B.O. You just can't smell your own. But you got it. And we love to point out others' stinkiness without the humility of saying, yeah, me too. I smell we all have our version of this spiritual axe body spray where we try to cover up our stinky parts by impress, impressing people, oppressing people with the smell of this one area, one facet of our holiness. We're so good in this one area, therefore to distract from the other areas of our lives that aren't quite what maybe they should be. They stink. And then we even use our holiness, our set-apartness, our, our, uh, our uniqueness, in relative terms as form of competition. Maybe around here it's more like, I know we're not like those other Christians, but in this area, we're radical. Man, we give all this money. We're missional. We take these risks. We love really broken people. But, you know, there, there's all this other stuff. We, let's not pay attention to that nonsense. These other contradictions in our lives. And it's a classic us versus them, man. We are holy in this and those Christians, we kind of write them off. Those people, we know we need to be different. We know in our bones we need to be holy. But we justify how we stink as long as we could judge those Christians over there. We weaponize our holiness. Our uniqueness becomes self-righteousness. And it makes us all hypocrites. Because we have our own little pet holiness issues. 
our little things we gravitate towards. We hold on to it super tight and ignore the contradictions of our lives. And God forbid that we get a few of us who are similar and we could group up and gang up on those believers, those people. And at the end of the day, our holiness, our uniqueness, our set-apartness in the world smells a lot like the world. And just like a middle school boy needs a bath, we need a system reboot when it comes to holiness, guys. We're in the day and age where this is, we just got to hit the reset button. Where does it come from? How do we get there? We need first Peter to help us with this. How do we live as elected exiles in this world? Belonging to heaven, but living in Babylon. Belonging to heaven, but going to the classes, our classes. You know, belonging to heaven and, and being in that conversation with that coworker who's talking about females in a certain way, that's not cool. How do we live here as elected exiles? Belonging to heaven, but being a part of that business deal or seeing that business deal that's not quite on the up and up. Belonging to heaven and spending our money and defining our sexuality and engaging in politics and buying our houses and getting a job and groceries and investing in 401ks. How do we be holy as God is holy in Babylon? Elected exiles. So I think it begins with God. I think this is appropriate. Irby might agree that it begins with God. The video begins with God. God is creator. God is creator God. This is one of the fundamental things that we know about him, that he is utterly different from creation. This makes him holy in his nature. He's different. And what happens with creation is that there's life and there's goodness. And it's different. It's different. It's different than everything else. He's different than everything else. And this is what the Bible means when it says God is holy. If we're going to hit the reboot, the reset we're going to take that middle school bath, we got to get back to God. What does it mean for him to be holy? He is different. He is life-giving. He is sustaining. And he is good. And of course, you guys know the story. We screw the pooch. And we're not holy. And we're dirty. And there's things like war. And divorce. And destruction. And decay. Right? There's division, and there's dehumanization. There's all kinds of ways we dehumanize each other, all kinds of ways we just say, you are less than what God has intended, you are less than human, and therefore we separate ourselves from the life-giving creator force of God, his purity, his holiness, and we become death. We collude, we agree with, we participate in death. This is what the Bible means by unholy, unholy clean anything that separates itself from the creator god who is life and goodness this is our present state you guys know what i'm talking about look at the news boom there you go this is watch out i've been working out with thomas you know what i'm saying jp <laughs> jk this is where we exist this is where we live but we know in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, this is First Peter, in Christ Jesus, he comes, he's revealed, and through his way, through his cross and resurrection, that empty tomb, man, it preaches, it preaches a new word to us, that we don't have to belong here anymore. He actually can transition us from death to life through his death, bodily death, bodily resurrection. This work of the cross and this empty tomb means a lot to us because God starts to undo our work through his work. And in this work, he gives us these identity markers. He says, guys, you're redeemed. Guys, you're, you're my children. Guys, you are now receivers of grace. Guys, in this one chapter, there's 10 indicators of identity in one chapter of this book. Let me just go through. You're elected. You're exiles. You're chosen according to the knowledge of God, chosen by God. You are served by the prophets who, to be receivers of their word. You are children of God. You are receivers of grace that you don't deserve. You're foreigners. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. You're born again and you're newborn babies. There's over 10 indicators of identity. And these are markers to say, you don't belong here anymore. You are mine. I have purchased you from death and brought about new life. And this is not a work that we could do on our own because it's hard to make yourself alive when you're dead. Amen? Easy. Easy logic problems. 
And this new identity, these new identities lead us to purpose that God has made us little temples. Little temples to go into the earth, to go into the, the, the space of the earth, this place where heaven and earth becomes thin. Any place where there's an overlap scripturally, where like heaven and earth, there's like a thin veil. This is Bethel. This is the temple. This is the burning bush. There's these moments where it's like the presence of God is here on the earth. This is temple. This is what the Bible means by temple, the holy of holies. And God comes in this space and he makes us that thing. Heaven on earth. We pray this prayer. God, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. And guess what? We, if you're filled with the Spirit, if you have this identity markers, are that answer. You are heaven on earth as temple. Let me just unpack that just a little bit more. Because there's two spaces that we typically, uh, the Hebrews would conceive of. There would be God space. And then there would be earth. Another way to put this would be flesh and spirit. Now the Jews don't think that the flesh is bad. That's, that's Greek thought. That's, that's pagan, Roman, like Gnosticism kind of, uh, it, it's actually bullcrap. So uh, it, that's not how the Jews conceive of it. But there are two different spaces. And this space is acting in rebellion. The flesh is not bad. It's just broken. And it needs to be redeemed. God is not coming to destroy the flesh. He's coming to redeem the flesh. And so what's happening is that God wants to overlap. This is the work of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. He comes heaven to earth to be with us. And it's in this overlap. This is temple. That's the temple space. That's the space redeeming the cosmos. God is bringing his resurrection life. His kingdom is coming. It is now here and it is coming. All the way, Revelation 21. This is where we're headed, guys. We need to come into alignment with the good creator God as his many temples. And when we do that, when we come into alignment with this, we are holy. That's what it means to be holy. Not to just have a list of rules and check some boxes. It means everything comes into alignment with God. His purposes, His nature. The only way to do that is to own our new nature in Christ Jesus and to live as His holy temples. This is what it means by holy. In us is the overlap of heaven and earth, His presence, on earth as it is in heaven. We as His temples imitate God, bring His life, His goodness, His restoration into a dying and broken world. We're his many temples who imitate God, the creator God, by bringing his holy life-giving presence everywhere we go. Not just when we're singing worship songs. Not just when we're making our marriage vows. Not, not just when we're raising our hand and saying, I want to I love Jesus. Not just in prayer time. Everywhere we go, we are called to bring the creator's life-giving presence to a dying world. This is what holiness is about. Not rules, not just killing the fun, not just another way to judge each other. Heaven on earth, his presence, his life, his goodness in us and through us. Mobile temples in the earth. The problem is that we have pet holiness issues, we have specialities that we weaponize against each other. Politics is a good one. If we, I think we would all agree that we need to become more holy in our politics, that we need to imitate God in our politics, that we need to uh, you know, figure out what, how would Jesus do politics. We probably would all agree on that. And then if we sat in the room together or we got together, we would go, over, we would go to war over what that may actually means. We would fight each other over what that actually means. We would choose our little pet version of what it means to be holy in politics and weaponize that against another brother or sister. And they would do the same to us. And in our attempt to be holy in the earth sphere called politics, we become unholy. We collude with division, hatred, and bitterness. And we are hypocrites. We need to be holy as God is holy in all facets of morality 
not just the ones that we favor. All of them. So I just want to teach you guys um, from this uh, guy named Jonathan Haidt. It's called The Five Parts of Moral Foundations. I thought this is helpful. This doesn't necessarily explicitly come from the Scripture or First Peter, but I thought it might be helpful to uh, unpack that for a bit. So if we could go ahead and put the image up on the screen. Uh, sociologists have basically been able to say hey, humans are moral creatures. This is one of the arguments for the existence of God. It's the moral argument for the existence of God. So, like, we have no problem with this. Human beings are moral creatures. And when in the research we can identify there's actually five types of morality within humanity. And like a soundboard where you could turn stuff up and stuff down, you could kind of turn a, turn a channel up or down. You could kind of say, man, I really love the guitar. Let's crank that sucker up. I really love the vocals. Let's crank that sucker up. I, I don't really like this bass line. Let me crank that down. Jimi Hendrix, he didn't really like his vocals very much. He cranked up his guitar and he turned down his vocals. That was his mix. We all have our holiness mixes. We mix the channels differently. And so I just want to go over those really quick and maybe this might help us move forward in holiness. The first one is uh, care and harm. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Um, foundation, care and kindness, okay. Um, slightly different. Uh, this is super clear for humans. This is just the idea of kindness. Like you should be kind to other human beings. You know, I know we mess it up quite a bit, but uh, it, it, everybody kind of agrees like, yeah, you should be kind at some level to other people. The second one is fairness. Um, you know, this is the idea of justice or trustworthiness. This is one of the first things that children recognize as being wrong in the world. Right? What do they say? That's not fair. And you say, give me that lollipop back. It's my lollipop now. That's what I told my kids. I said. The third one is loyalty. This, is, this allows us to be in groups. This allows us to play sports. It's a lot of fun. Man, human beings love to group up. And we love to group up and attack each other. This is like a favorite pastime of ours. This is how we get sports. It's also how we get war. And there's a lot of self-sacrifice when it comes to loyalty. We will like bury ourselves for the sake of our group. And it's awesome. There's the fourth one, there, the authority. This is like obedience and this is the deference because of love. This is where we get marriage vows and patriotism and just obeying the laws. Like this is what the law says. I, I need to submit to this law, okay? And so, you know, you know, people will kind of like raise that up on the, you know, morality, uh, uh, you know, spectrum. And the last one is purity, sanctity, piety, cleanliness, chastity. You obtain virtue by what you do with your body. So you work out or there's ways that we talk about sex or, or whole foods. This is whole foods. Whole foods is basically high purity, you know. Organic, if you're super into organic stuff or non-GMO stuff, like you're a high purity person. You've just chosen that version of purity. Okay, so there's secular versions for all this. There's biblical versions for this is just a human thing. So I'm not saying like one's good or one's bad. I'm saying this is just human across the board. Now we as the people of God have to discern how do we adjust this. And the thing is, is we adjust it differently. Some of us really like the drums. Some of us really like the vocals. Some of us, you know, just try to even all out. Guys, it's not that people don't care about the other channel of morality. They've just adjusted it different from you. So all the research says between liberals and conservatives, they come out different on these things. Their sound mixes look really different. But they all have a sound mix. All five channels exist. But we usually go over to war over the, the, the prioritization and where you emphasize what. That's where we go to war over. Okay? But it's not like, oh, that person doesn't care about purity. Or that person doesn't care about submission. Or that person doesn't. No, actually, everybody cares about those things in some way, in some order. People of God, if you have this identity, we need to be holy in all of it. We can't just choose one aspect of holiness and weaponize it against those who have other aspects turned up or turned down. We can't say it's all about caring for people while allowing them to degrade their bodies that God has given them to glorify Him. In politics, we've got to be little temples in kindness and justice and loyalty and authority and purity. We have to discern how to be holy in a comprehensive way, not just our little pet project ways. And this is difficult. And that's why 
I think First Peter says we need each other because we, have all our, we all have our biases. Our, our personal holinesses are all lopsided at best. That's why we have to love each other from the heart. That's why the text is saying you must love each other from the heart. You must get rid of malice. All these divisive things, you have to get rid of them. Why? Because you need each other. You cannot be temple. We cannot be temple without each other. We will always be lopsided. So a couple examples, um, just to maybe try to flesh this out and make it more uh, concrete, is uh, some of us have a, a high purity sense of, of holiness when it comes to language. So cursing, F-bombs are offensive and confusing. Why Christians might engage in such carnal language. I, I don't, I'm not sure if any of people in here like that. Um, I'm definitely like that. I'm completely offended by uh, the way Christians are using foul language, like the world uses foul language. So I have a very high kind of, that thing is ramped up, okay? And if you cuss around me, I always wince inside. My little, like, pancreas goes, you know, type of thing. Just so you know. Other of us have a high care sense of holiness, so cussing, dropping F-bombs, is just another way to make other people feel comfortable and just demonstrate humanity. See how that works? And other of us have a high justice sense. And so dropping F-bombs seems like a great way to describe some of these injustices in this world. Amen? And so now we get together and we're like, wait, which is it? How do, how do we actually be holy in all of it? This is difficult. The question is not, can we curse or can we not curse? Should we drop F-bombs or not drop F-bombs? The question is, is how do we be temple with language? How do we be what God has called us and identified us to be with language. And there is a way the world uses language that brings division and harm and lies, and we should not align with it at all. We must be holy. How can we break from the pattern of this world and align with God's goodness and be the temples He has made us to be in the area of language? And so those of us who are potty mouths need the Puritans and vice versa. We need each other to discern what does it mean to be temple with our language, to be holy with our language. Floyd McClung really confronted, um, I was with Brian, and, uh, Brian Sanders and Jason Thompson, and this guy Floyd McClung, who is like a, a preeminent missionary kind of brother, uh, like basically when I get to be 70 years old, I want to be Floyd McClung, okay? So like loves Jesus, taking risks, like has just lived a life running after the Father heart of God, like amazing brother. And he sat down and he was just noticing how we joked with each other how we're being sarcastic about stuff and we're just kind of like, you know, there's a little like, it's playful banter, but it's a little biting, but it's also a little funny. And, and, we're, and, we're, and if you see the three of us ever get together, we crack each other up like regularly. Like we just, we just think each other's hilarious and I think we are hilarious objectively, empirically, but you know, that's up to you to judge. I, but, but he sits down and he goes, man, you guys are like really sarcastic. I say, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, it's fun, it's edgy, you know, it's really cool. And he's like, yeah, the Lord convicted me not to be sarcastic like 20 years ago. He goes, he goes, the Lord convicted me that it's lying. It's a form of lying. I was like, we're all like, hmm. <laughs> and we need each other. And he also, at the same time, loved the way we were interacting and loving each other. And it was clear that there was affection for each other. And at the same time, he's like, yeah, you know, we need to discern how we use sarcasm. We need to discern, are we falling into the traps of lying. We need each other. But what we can't continue to do is default to how the world uses language. We are redeemed. Foreigners. We don't imitate the world. We imitate a good father who has redeemed us and made us his temples. Another issue might be sexuality. Some of us have turned up the purity channel on sexuality super high. Pornography, premarital sex, same-sex relationships. We have a very clear sense of what holiness looks like. And you're right. You're right. There's a pattern to how the world thinks and operates in its sexuality that brings destruction, death, and decay. And we should not agree with it. But sometimes, we're not holy in our kindness. So you might be holy in your purity, not holy in your kindness. 
And some of us have turned up the, t- the kindness channel. It's all about love and not driving people away and walking with people in their struggles. And you're right. There's a pattern to how the world rejects those different and doesn't engage with kindness. And we should not agree with it. But sometimes we're so kind to the point that there really isn't anything impure or off limits anymore, except not to be kind. And this is just one, these are just a couple of social spheres, places on earth that we're being called to be many temples, to be holy, to be like God in our nature. And we need each other to discern. How do we be temple in Babylon, in the earth space called sexuality, called politics, called money, called relationships, called language? How do we discern how to be holy? Some of us need to care more for those who break our purity standards. And others need to acknowledge caring for people might include hurting their feelings by saying this is wrong and does not align with God's good design for life. And we need each other. I mean, I need, I need help. I need help. I need, you know, I, I have neighbors who are living together, having babies together, not married, technically living in sexual sin. And they're broken and they're fighting and they're dividing with one another. They're not together anymore. And what do I do? Do I help them get together? Do I help them get married? Do I help them? What, 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 what do I do in this sense? How do, I, how do I be temple to my neighbors? How do I bring the temple of Jesus, the holiness of God, the life-giving presence of Jesus into that situation? Do I just ramp up the purity and say, you guys are fornicating, y'all need to stop? Do I do that? Maybe. Do I just say, hey, it's all good, just like, you know, don't worry about it, just love each other really well? Do I just do that? How do I get, how do I, how do I be temple? Guys, I need you to help me with that. Because if I have to decide on my own, I bias it towards myself. And holiness looks a lot like me. And let's just amen, that's kind of gross. Amen? Yeah. I think we need to triangulate our discernment process when it comes to holiness. Because if we just get together, you and me and a couple other broken temples, we could decide on stuff and say it's holy. That doesn't mean it's holy, right? Holiness by democracy? No, no, no. <laughs> this is God's word. This is you and this is me. Or, you know, you and other believers. And this is what we need. Discernment through the Spirit who illuminates all things that are true. We need God's word. I need you. You need me. We need each other. And we need God's spirit living in active presence to teach us his ways. We need all of this. If you just go to the word without other people and without the spirit, whew, that's how we get the crusades. Okay? If it's just us, this is just how we get some heresy. If it's just you and the spirit, how do you know? Where's the verification that it's not just the pizza you ate last night? We need all of this to discern how do we be temple together. This is how Paul puts it. He gives us almost a process. It takes a listening ear to discern the will of God. He says in Romans 12, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you want to know God's will, step one, break from the patterns of this world. Don't try to justify the patterns of this world and call it God's will. Break the pattern. Now, you are free in Christ to discern His will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You'll be able to hear 
and discern how do we be elected exiles. But first, we must break the patterns of this world. How do we be temple when coaching our kids' soccer team? How do we be temple as a teacher when those kids start popping off? Right, Tiffany? How do we be temple when the homeless addict comes knocks on the window of your car door? How do you be temple when there's conflict that seems beyond reconciliation? How do we be temple in the 2020 election coming up? We need to discern with God's word, with each other, and with his illuminating spirit. We must discern how to be temple by breaking the patterns of this world and discovering what God's will is for our day, for our age, for us. I just want to spend a few minutes doing a workshop. Is that okay? I like workshops. We're almost done, so don't freak out. If you're really hot, just turn to your neighbor and blow on them. But we have some sheets of paper. I want, I want us to group in groups four and five. And we have papers. And it's like a little worksheet. And it just works you through maybe a process for how to discern together holiness. How do we break from the patterns of this world? Can we even identify what the patterns are? Can we choose an identity marker that helps us break that pattern? For example, if, if, I, if the love of money is one of the patterns of this world, and I, if I walk in the identity that I'm a child of God for all eternity then I have broken the need for anxiety, the need for love, the need to pursue money because I'm a child of God. You see how that identity marker helps you break. And then you can see, let's discern for a few minutes. How do we be temple in this space? Through the issues of care, fairness, justice, loyalty, authority, purity. How do we do that? So it, it might be a little bit weird. I'm not going to give you a ton of time. I just want to make it a little more concrete. And say, let's actually walk through this. Let's actually do an exercise. Let's try to discern what's the pattern of this world when it comes to X. Just choose one. How, do, how does the world normally operate in this area? Let's choose an identity marker that helps us break that pattern. And let's start to discern some new ways of living as temple in that area. Is that okay if we just do that for five minutes? Okay, and again, if you're hot, just, hey, just so you know, this front row is really cool because this fan, JP is right there. That's why JP is right here. So, all right, so take five minutes. Uh, if, there, there's only 40 pieces of paper, so if you're sitting next to somebody with a paper, you need to pass that along to somebody else who doesn't have any. So, uh, if we get some runners to help with that, because I, I think we basically, there's like a whole entire row with paper. There's only 40 of them because we're, we need to be in groups of four and five. All right, I'll, guys, I'll give you five minutes, and then, and then we'll start wrapping stuff up.
Hey, one more, one more minute, guys. One more minute. So I know that's not a lot of time. I'm sorry. All right, let's bring it back together. Sorry, I know that wasn't enough time. Um, but I, I just wanted to, that's my attempt of saying, okay, what, what if we became more fluent in a process of discernment when it comes to holiness, when it comes to becoming temple? You know, could we become more fluent? And is that a part of our way of becoming and being temple in this world? Is actually having a process of discernment instead of just, judging each other and just pointing at each other about how each other stink. Actually saying, man, actually, I, I need you and you need me and we both need God's word and we need to discern together with his spirit. This is a process of discernment and it may take years. Hopefully your entire life, you're always coming back and saying, I need to come back to the word. I need to come back to scripture. I need to come back in prayer. I need to come back with my friends who are different from me and let's discern together. How do we be God's good temple, His presence, heaven on earth, in this sphere? At least, if everybody in our society is doing something, we should at least call it into question. Say, wait, what does it mean to be temple here? For example, social media. Everybody does social media. I mean, almost. Should we even do it then? We have to call that into question. We have to place that at the foot of the cross and say, in discernment, should I even engage in social media? If everybody else, the pattern of the world is to engage in social media, should I even touch it with a 10-foot pole? Or if I do, how do I engage in social media? Or entertainment? Or what? Everything. We are foreigners. And we must discern together. If the worship team, go ahead and uh, come on up. We'll just kind of wrap things up here. Um, there's four factors if you're going to change from a place of like living in the patterns of this world to a, a different place. And it has to do with faith. Um, there's, there's a little data graph here. You have like data one, data two. If you're, wherever your faith is great, your confidence in something is greater... You will do that thing. So your confidence in a way of living, you will do that thing. So it's, it's really about faith. It's really about confidence. And I think we're not as confident in our identity markers in Christ Jesus as we need to be. We actually still think that we belong to this world. We actually still believe that we are these sinners, that we're not hidden in Christ. We actually, we have greater confidence in our jacked up minds than we have in the work of the cross. We're just not sure that he has redeemed us. 
We think we still got to be holy. We still think we have to clean ourselves up to then be temple. No, you have been made temple by the work of Christ Jesus. So now, align yourself with that truth. Align yourself with his goodness, his presence. But what do you have confidence in? Do you have confidence? Which identity do you have confidence in? Who gets to make the rules? Jesus says, you're mine. But you're the one saying, maybe not. Do you have the power to do that? If you want to make a change, if you find yourself, yeah, I actually, I actually don't believe in my identity that much in Christ. I actually wonder about it quite a bit. I don't always feel like this child of God kind of person. Then the way you change a belief system is you hang out. You dream and you hang out with those that do believe in it. And so in this example, you got to hang out with Jesus then. Because he's the one saying, you're my child. You're the one who's redeemed. You're the one who's saved. You're the one who's pure. You're the one who's I'm making into new creation. You're the one I'm sending out as my representative. You're the one who's an ambassador. You're the one with healing presence found within you to the world. He's the one saying that. So if you're not so sure about that, what I'm saying to you is you got to hang out with them. Because when you hang out with somebody long enough, you start acting like them, laughing like them, liking the shows they like. You guys know what I'm talking about? Besties. You got to become besties with Jesus again. You got to hang out with them. You got to hang out with his people who are pursuing holiness. You got to crave spiritual milk. This is what he says in the text. You got to crave spiritual milk. Babies, when they're newborn moms, do they not think they're starving when they're hungry? They have a hormonal, like, imperative uh, a, a stimulus that basically says I need food like right now and if I don't get food right now I'm going to starve guys we need to start craving spiritual milk we got to start realizing if I don't hang out with Jesus then I'm starving to death and we got to start crying like babies God you got to come God you got to come you, I need your presence I need your word I need your holiness I need your fellowship I need you to make me what you've already made me. In the presence, we got to start hanging out with Jesus and taste that the Lord is good. Taste it. Crave it. Leave the evil desires behind because you're pursuing and craving whole grain truth from the mouth of the Lord. Guys, if we come to the table today, I'm asking, would you be holy as God is holy? Would we, me, you, be holy as God is holy? Would you commit to being his temple, what he's already made you to be? Would you align to his goodness? And some of you, I don't know, you might get a sense like, man, I'm kind of convicted that I stink. Yeah, my soundboard is all kind of messed up. Would you come to the table and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry? For pursuing unholiness in unholy ways. Maybe you just know, hey, I need to crank up this one channel. Would you just ask him at the table, Jesus, increase my holiness in this one channel, in this one way. It's just off. And maybe you're convicted to stop doing something or to start doing something. To align in your calling to be his temple. Just commit to him at the table today. Jesus, because of your work at the cross, I commit to doing this or not doing this. Not because you'll like me more, but because it agrees with what you've already said of me. Because it agrees with life. I'm going to step away from X or I'm going to step towards Y. I don't know what it is for you. But I do ask that as we come to the table today that you come in holiness. Convicted holiness. God, I want to be your temple. Everywhere I go, your temple presence. 
And so the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he took bread and he broke it. He gave thanks. He said, this is my body. This is what I've done for you. Broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This makes all things new. Everything. Do this whenever you drink this. And when we do this, when we celebrate this broken body and this blood that was spilt, we declare to the world the cross, the redemption, the salvation of Jesus Christ until his return. You are a foreigner. You are a child. Come to a good father who's done a good work for you to make you something for this dying world. Guys, the body and blood of Jesus given for you.